Hi everybody, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the clinical trainers for Linton. I'm here today to talk to you about your Fitzpatrick scale. So we're looking at who is it that you're treating and how do we need to change or adapt our treatments around that. So when we think about your Fitzpatrick scale, what we know. So with your Fitzpatrick scale, it is a, a numerical classification that was created um, for, for human skin colour. So it was developed by a gentleman called Thomas B. Fitzpatrick in 1975. And it was used as a way to really kind of estimate the response of different skin types to UV light. So initially when it was developed, it was developed around the basis of um, what was the correct dosage of UVA light uh, for PUVA treatment or therapy. Now, the Fitzpatrick scale is something that's become very, very important within the aesthetic industry. Uh, and the reason being is that we know that different aesthetic treatments, and I'm not talking just about laser and light, I'm talking about skin peeling, needling, you name it. These treatments all run certain risks um, and certain risks of unwanted reactions. So we take this into consideration. It's probably one of the first things as practitioners that we all do, um, you know, that we look at our client and we try to assess how best we can treat them um, whilst really maintaining safety. So as I said, you know, the reasons that we do it is we use it so that we can tailor our treatments to each every individual. This will enable us to support treatment protocols so that we can ensure that we're using correct parameters, um, using you know, the, the right amount or delivering the right amount of treatments at the correct, correct intervals. But also really, really importantly, we're more so looking for the safety element. Okay, so how can we keep your client safe whilst maintaining clinical efficacy, efficacy while we you know, get those best treatment results? Now, as I said to you, the Fitzpatrick scale is kind of all developed around how the skin responds to the sun. So the thing that we really have to consider, especially when it comes to laser and lights, is melanin production. Okay, And we know that melanin, whilst we use it for a lot of our treatments, actually can pose quite a big threat. Now, what we know is between the epidermis and the dermis, you have a little boundary line of melanocytes. And these melanocytes will create your pigment or your melanin. Um, and what they're designed to do is they're designed to be your, your defense mechanism against the sun. So you go out into the sun, your skin will obviously start experiencing UV exposure. Those UV rays will travel down through the skin layers and the melanocytes should identify that. What those melanocytes should start doing is start producing more melanin in order to um, prevent and kind of stop that UV exposure traveling deeper down into the tissue. Now, obviously for some individuals, someone like myself, I'm quite fair, I'm a redhead, um, I don't have a great deal of melanin within my skin, my content's not very high, so I burn quite quickly. Whereas other individuals of a darker skin type, because they have a much higher natural melanin content there, it means they're able to protect themselves a little bit better. Um, so what we know is, is that generally darker skin types, because they have more melanin than your lighter, they will therefore create a lot more heat but also maintain it for a lot longer as well. So what we know is that, or what we tend to kind of get this misconception um, about is that fairer skin types are normally, people initially think, oh, well, they're the most sensitive because they burn really easily in the sun. Whereas actually when it comes to laser treatments, it's quite the opposite. That's, it, you know, the, the paler the skin type, the less risk there is. Now, one of the things we do have to consider besides obviously your melanin content or, or um, can, uh, production is your thermal relaxation time. So your thermal relaxation time is basically us heating something up, okay, and how long it takes for that item to, to lose the heat. So if, for example, you take a glass of water and you raise that up to 100 degrees centigrade and then allow it to drop down to 50, it's the time that it would take to get from 100 to 50 degrees that we would class as the thermal relaxation time. What we know is all the different appendages of the body, of the skin, have different thermal relaxation times. So we know the larger the target, the, the more it's going to hold on to that heat and, the, and the, the more it will heat up overall. Whereas when you've got something of a smaller target, generally, yes, it will heat up, but it's going to lose that heat quite quickly. So if you take, for example, a, a teacup and a bathtub, you heat both up um, with boiling hot water at the same time, and then you leave both of them for half an hour. 
After that half an hour period, what you should find is actually the teacup will be the coldest because there's less target within it. Um, and that's what we tend to know when we think about our skin types. The darker the skin type, the longer they'll hold on to that heat and generally overall the hotter they're going to get. So if we think about treatments, for example, so let's say, let's think about hair removal. We have to adapt our treatments in order and our treatment parameters in order to keep our clients safe. And we take that thermal relaxation into account. Now, if we say we're treating, I don't know, let's look at IPL. Okay, so let's look at IPL, we're treating a fairer skin type. We might be using settings within the region of say 22 fluents, three, dual, uh, three pulses, um, with a delay time of, of 15 milliseconds. Now, when we think about hair removal, we obviously want to treat the hair, and we know the main target within the hair is melanin. But the other problem that we have is that there's a lovely little sprinkling of melanocytes sitting between that epidermal and dermal boundary line, which ultimately, it doesn't matter what we do, we are always going to get heating in that region. But what I want you to do is think about as those little melanocytes being your teacup and your hair being your bathtub. There's more target in that hair. So what you should find is that the hair is going to get a lot hotter and it should retain the heat a lot better than what your skin will. So if we have a look at it, so if we deliver our, our energy and pulses, so and what I'm going to do is I'm going to deliver my first pulse, okay? So that first pulse is going to be delivered down into the skin. And what you're going to find is that you're going to get bulk heating, not only within the hair, but also within those melanocytes as well, sitting between the epidermal and dermal boundary line. But what I'm now going to do is I'm going to have a short delay. And that short delay should allow for enough time for, for some of that heat to escape. Now, as I said to you, because my hair is a bigger target, it's going to retain that heat a lot better. Whereas those melanocytes are quite a thin sprinkling, more like my teacup and they should lose the heat quite quickly. So now that I've had that first delay, I'm now going to enter or deliver my second pulse of light. That second pulse of light is going to build a, build a much greater heat within that hair. Again, we'll get heating in those, those upper layers of the skin as well, but I'm now going to have another delay to allow for some of that heat to escape. But my hair still being that stronger target, that bigger target is going to retain that heat a lot better. I then deliver my third and final pulse, okay? That third and final pulse, again, I'll get great heating in the hair. I'm definitely going to get heating in the skin also. But what I've done now is I've caused enough heating within the hair to cause uh, damage to its surrounding follicle to inhibit its regrowth. But I've managed, because I keep having those small delays in between, I've managed to keep the skin below a damage threshold. And that's really what we have to consider. So when we're doing any of our treatments, whether it be hair removal, whether it be pigmentation, whether it be vascular, whether it be rejuvenation, we always have to consider that melanin, those melanocytes within the skin, because what we don't want to do is we don't want to cause thermal um, destruction in that area, because that's really when it's going to lead on to, to possible reactions, um, unwanted reactions like pigmentation, hyperpigmentation and blistering and burns and so on and so forth. So, when we think about our Fitzpatrick skin type scale, and I know everybody does it a bit differently, I think the Linton way of doing it is really easy, really precise, and um, you get a lot of information from your clients quite quickly. So the first thing we want to do is we want to give them a scenario. We need to know how their skin responds in the sun. So I always say, you know, pick somewhere in the world, super hot, really exotic, lovely beach, anywhere you'd like to travel to. And now I'll say, I don't know, the Maldives. Okay, and you want to give them a scenario that they're in the Maldives, they're on the beach, midday summer sun with no sun protection. Everybody in the right environment will burn. Okay, obviously we know the paler skin types will definitely burn a lot quicker. So that's the first thing you need to find out. I also then need to, or I'd like to ask, um, once they've burned, how quickly do they tend to see that transition from a burn to a tan? So for me, for example, I am um, in that scenario, gosh, I would burn super quick. So within 15 minutes, you'd see my skin going quite pink. I would definitely burn very badly. And then it would probably take a good sort of four, anywhere up to seven days for that burn to subside before you start to see my tan coming through. And my tan's not a deep tan. It is um, a slightly healthier glow, I would say. I definitely do get tan lines, but they're just not that strong. 
The second question you want to be asking is about your family ethnic origin. Okay, so we need to know about parents and grandparents. Where are they from? And then the last thing, not so much necessarily, or it might be a question, you might need to ask them if you're unsure if they've dyed their hair or whatever it may be. But you need to know what your client's natural hair colour, eye colour is, their natural skin tone, but also look out for other things like, you know, are they freckly? Freckling is generally a, a, a characteristic of a lighter skin type, for example. So not something that is as commonly seen in your darker. So once you've asked and gained all the information from those three points there, that should enable you to really determine what or who your client is in terms of their skin type. OK, so when we think about the skin type scale, it is a scale of one to six, one being the fairest, six being considered the darkest. Your skin type one, we would consider as your kind of Celtic fairer skin types. Always burns, never tans. Now, I quite commonly get skin typed as a skin type one because I am naturally very fair. I'm a redhead with green eyes. I freckle and I definitely can burn very, very easily. And I have one white Irish and one white English parent. Now, I do have the ability to get a tan, albeit not a, the darkest. So I actually should be within the skin type two category. So skin type two, we tend to categorize as kind of your more Northern European skin types. Will definitely burn, so they usually burn, but can sometimes get a tan. And I'm not talking that dark, deep, intense tan. Uh, I'm talking that kind of more healthy glow, but they definitely will get tan lines. Your skin type three. So your skin type three, you tend to find are your more Southern European skin types. Um, so we're talking, well, that you know, they can burn, but they will always tan, okay? And they tend to get quite a good tan. A common characteristic of a, of a skin type three would be um, a brunette with a brown or a hazel eye, okay? Whereas you tend to find that skin type ones um, tend to have a, a green, gray or blue eye um, and tend to be your fairer or lighter hair types as well. So blonde, uh, red, white, um, for example, kind of your mousy browns. But don't get me wrong, you know, you definitely can get a blonde and blue eyed individual who is a skin type three that tans very, very well. So not everybody quite fits the same category. Your skin type four, this is where we start to run slightly into your, your darker um, elements. So Middle Eastern and fairer Asian skin type. So what we know about these is that they, you know, they rarely burn and they do tan with ease. Now, when we think about fairer Asian skin types, this does include anybody of a, a Chinese or a Japanese heritage. And um, visually, whilst they may be quite pale in colour, they definitely have the ability to tan very well. Um, and you generally find from skin type four and onwards, they are more prone to pigmentation issues, which is something that we definitely need to be um, considerate of. Your skin type five, we would consider to be your darker Asian skin types. Again, rarely burns, definitely tans with great ease. Um, and then with your skin type six, we're talking uh, Afro-Caribbean skin types. Now, in the right circumstances, they can burn, but it takes a lot. Um, but they definitely tan with, with such great ease. What you do have to be careful of is sometimes you'll look at a patient and you think they're kind of between a, a two and a three. OK, you know, if you're ever unsure, they're kind of sitting on the, the borderline between two, between two skin types. The safest route to go is to the darker. So in the event you've got somebody you think, oh, they're two or they're three, put them to the three, okay? Because your treatment parameters will be safer and you've got then more wiggle room if you need to. Also, be careful of a client with clients of a mixed heritage. So say in the example, you've got a client who has a skin type one parent and a skin type six parent. Visually to look at, they may only, you know, they might look like a skin type four, for example. But what we know is, is that when you do have somebody of a mixed heritage, they are more commonly um, or more likely to respond like the darker parent in the event of an adverse reaction than they are the lighter. So what we would ask you to do is that you skin type your client as the darker parent, again, just to err on the side of caution. OK, as I said, there is a little bit of wiggle room beyond that, but you always want to start in the safest position possible. 
So what we know about your skin type, so your Fitzpatrick skin types, is that skin type one contains the least melanin. Therefore, they will heat up the least, so the highest energies can be used quite safely with, with very little risk. Skin types four to six are definitely more prone to side effects, including that of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, where you see a darkening of the skin, or hyperpigmentation, where you see a lightening of the skin. Um, so therefore, we know that they need to be treated with far greater caution. We tend to say that skin type six can only be treated with an ND YAG laser. Never, ever, ever would you touch a skin type six with an IPL. There are some exceptions to the rule for any of you out there that have our motor system. Um, so we obviously know that with the pain-free mode, you can treat a skin type six on Alex, but that is quite a, a rare, exceptional circumstance. Ordinarily, it would always only ever be an ND YAG, okay? And as I said, if you're ever in doubt, make sure that you're assigning the darker skin type. And just please, please, when you're treating your clients of mixed heritage, assign them to the darker skin parent or grandparent, okay? With that, again, you can only take that on if your client knows, you know, for example, if you have a client who perhaps is adopted, who doesn't know their biological background, you can only go on how they respond in the sun and obviously their physical features. Um, but obviously, the more information you are able to get, the easier it's going to be for you to make that 100% right decision. Now, your higher risk skin types. What we know, as I've already said to you, is that a skin type four to six, they are more prone to, the, um, to side effects. And it's all due to the greater melanin content that they have within their skin. As I've already said to you, we know that skin types four to six, because they do have that higher melanin content, not only are they going to heat up a great deal more, but also they're going to retain that heat a lot better than someone of a fairer skin type. We know that your skin types four to six are a great of risk of suffering with the following. Burns, okay, which automatically can lead on to blistering. What you tend to see is um, some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, so they get a darkening of the skin, or they receive hyperpigmentation where they completely lose the pigment within the area and the skin goes considerably lighter than the surrounding. And obviously scarring is definitely um, you know, a possibility. To be fair, not that common, um, especially if the area is really well looked after um, post-reaction, but it is still a possibility, okay? All skin types can suffer with any of these reactions. Um, you know, and that's why we put certain restrictions in place, especially around tanning and the use of certain medications. But especially for your darker skin types, we know there is that much higher risk. So one question we always get asked a lot is how we can adapt our, our treatments for, for darker skin types. I think, especially as I said, you know, for a, for a newer practitioner, um, it can be quite a daunting prospect because you know there are higher risks involved. Now, with all clients, as I said to you, treatment should always, always be tailored to suit the needs of every single client. But here are some simple steps that you can take, um, especially with those higher risk clients, to minimise it and hopefully should give you a very safe and very effective treatment. So the first thing you've obviously got to do is you've got to ensure that the modality that you're using is suitable. So as I said to you already, you know, if you have an IPL system, for example, that should never be used on somebody who is a skin type six. For hair removal, you know, for a Linton system, you can comfortably use that on a skin type one to five, but never ever on a skin type six. We generally overall use much lower fluences. So as I said, with darker skin types, not only do they heat up a great deal more, but they obviously retain it a lot, well, a lot better than a lighter skin type as well. So generally speaking, we tend to use lower fluences. We also tend to find that your pole durations are longer or you're using longer pole strings. You know, if you're thinking um, about an ND YAG laser system, for example, you might be using pulse trains or pulse durations within the range of anywhere from say about 30, maybe even up to 50 milliseconds. Um, whereas on a lighter skin type, it might be anywhere from say around 15 through to, to 30. When it comes to YPL, we use more pulses and we use longer delays. So we break that energy down into, into smaller pulses, lower fluences, um, delivering it so we can build it up, but we have more pulses in between or more delays in between those to allow for additional cooling uh, of the skin. We generally recommend that you'd work at slower repetition rates as well. So that's your hertz. Um, and again, the reason we do that is to allow for a little bit more cooling. Um, 
just so that we're not putting too much heat into the skin. We always recommend, I mean, for any skin type, we will always recommend a bit of pre and post treatment cooling, definitely post treatment cooling. You know, it absolutely is key to try and extract that heat as, as quickly as possible post treatment and to, to minimize those reactions. But even more so on your darker skin types, as we know, they heat up more, they retain it better. Therefore, a lot more cooling should be done. Even if your client is saying to you, you know, oh, it's fine, it doesn't hurt, it feels normal, I'm quite happy. Always, always, always do the cooling. Okay, it's super important. That can either be done with cryo um, air chillers or it could, you know, cool packs, um, cold compresses, but please just don't, don't use ice directly on the skin. Um, and it may also be necessary to defer certain treatments for longer periods of time, especially post sun exposure. You know, for we say a minimum guideline would be that for any treatments, you know, especially with lasers, typically speaking, we ask you to wait a minimum of four weeks post exposure before you would consider patch testing and, and retreating your client. What we know is, is we want for that tan to, to fully subside before we go back into treatment. Now, the darker the skin type, the longer they hold that tan for. Um, so obviously it could be, we say, you know, minimum of four weeks, but it could be anything up to eight to 12 weeks, really potentially in some instances, a little bit longer. So we know by doing all of that, that we can keep our client as safe as possible. And as I said, maintain those clinical results. Okay. So thanks very much for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've taken a few bits from it. If at any point you have any questions, please don't, you know, don't be afraid to contact clinical, drop us an email um, and hopefully we'll be able to help. Thanks for listening.